Thank you, Mike. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's a um, great pleasure to see so many of you here. Um, some of you will have known that um, Taylor Swift's um, <laughs> tickets for her tour, um, her European tour, went on sale on Monday. I'm glad to say, though, the Common Swift remains the hottest gig in town. So it's, um, it's great to see so many of you here. It's particularly good to welcome once more the fantastic Mark Cocker, once again to Leek and here to the Foxlow Art Centre. Um, we're here to discuss Mark's new book, um, this of which copies are free, not freely available, <laughs> <laughs> they are very available at a very reasonable price um, at, at various points, um, inclu including Mark from Mark himself. Um, we're here to discuss Mark's new book and, um, and um, then the sky's the limit, there will be time for, many time for questions afterwards, but first a few housekeeping and other notes. Um, Morland Climate's Action crack technical team, that's um, Alison, Nigel and myself, in case you didn't know. We've done our best to make sure that, um, that you can see and hear as well as you can, but um, could I ask, um, just could you, or to, to help us in that task, could all of you please turn off your mobile phones? And where appropriate, turn hearing aids on. Um, I hope it won't be needed. Um, I'd also like to direct you to some slips of paper which are on your seats. Um, they're, they're, that is an invitation to um, a swift spotting walk tomorrow, run by our very good friends um, in Swifts of Leek. Um, Kate, I think you're here, I think. Yes, Kate, I, I think it's starting at the marketplace. Yes. Great, and hopefully ending up in Hairgate. Uh, yes. Good, the ward I'm proud to represent and um, the home of the most abundant swift population in Leek, um, otherwise known as the, the, the jewel in the crown of the Queen of the Moorlands. Um, anyway. So, um, I, and for last, last before we get, get, it, get into the main session, I, I'd, I'd like to um, invite forward, congratulate and invite forward the winner of our first Swifts of Summer competition. Um, all the way from his new Cheshire home, migrating back to his homeland of the Staffordshire Moorlands, David Gold, who wrote a very touching piece. It's here for you to, people to read later on what Swifts mean to him and his family and to be presented with um, a, a prize of a book signed by the author. I'll sign the later. Before we broaden out too much, and, and don't sure, worry, Mark. we just discuss the images? Briefly? Yes, you, yeah. Um, I, um, I planned increasingly to do a few pictures, and um, this one slightly got out of hand. There are 600 pictures. Okay. And essentially, they're, a, they're an oblique reference on the content of the book. They map out many of the themes. You don't have to look at them, but if you find us boring, then look at the pictures. There are 33 or 34 countries represented on six continents over 37 years the images have been taken. And yes, I know, climate change is largely down to me. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an attempt to express in visual form the kinds of issues that we'll discuss tonight. And it just runs as a kind of wallpaper, but hopefully it'll be interesting. And it just runs on a loop. Absolutely. Well, we won't run on a loop, Mark. So, um, before, and before we broaden out too much, uh, and like I say, I will give you time to spread your wings and develop the themes that you, you, you're, you are developing in, in, in these images. Let's focus tightly on Swifts themselves. Just what is so special about Swifts? There are so many other birds in the world. Um, why did you choose Swifts above all else? Well, I didn't. Um, I chose the blackbird. Um, I started uh, eight, uh, 2008 on this book, and I wanted to kind of widen out the themes of a previous book, Crow Country. Mm -hmm. And um, it had to be black, of course, don't tell me why, but I love blackbirds. And I love blackbirds. 
And so the first notebook for this project was, I tipexed on the front, Blackbird, thinking that I'd try and write a book about blackbirds, but somehow express how a blackbird was never just in and of itself a single species, isolated and wonderful, though that is, that everything is, is interdependent and that, you know, we can't think of any organism as alone and solitary, that it is essentially part of an integrated system. So I started off with blackbirds as my favorite bird. And then I realized blackbirds didn't quite start to do a lot of research on blackbirds. So I then incorporated swifts, so it was blackbirds and swifts. And, and then eventually, about 2018, I, I dropped blackbirds altogether. Please forgive me, you who love blackbirds, and, and focused on swifts, because swifts offer themselves as a perfect, um, uh, globally significant bird. First of all, it has an enormous distribution across the whole of what's called the Palearctic region from, as I say, from Ballycotton to, to Beijing, from Ireland to China. And, and then it makes these world-wrapping journeys that incorporate or, or, or include whole continents. You know, the bird can cross from West Africa to, to its place in Cambridge in a matter of two weeks. Uh, and then there were all sorts of other things which made swift so appropriate. I mean, it's the only heightened vertebrate life form, and more than bats and more than any other bird's whatsoever, including swallows and house martins, although they are almost equally wonderful and joyous. But swifts truly live in air. And this allowed me to start to think about how we could write about our one great um, corporate, I mean all of life on Earth, our one co corporate or shared enterprise, which is our atmosphere created by life. So that was also perfect. So in so many ways, I realized that, you know, had I been a poet, this would be, you know, as Ted Hughes chose the crow to express something about modernity and modern life in the 20th century. I thought Swifts lent themselves as an, an extraordinary symbol to talk about the interconnectedness of all things. So in reality, you didn't choose Swifts, Swifts chose you. Swifts chose themselves, really, right. because of all their own ecology, etc. And, uh, and the more I journeyed into them, um, the more I realised how appropriate they were. But at the same time, I am, I am emphatic when anybody talks about the book. I've just reprimanded Suffolk Wildlife Trust and said I've written a book about Swifts. You know, it's not just about Swifts. No. It's about... It's about it's about the wholeness of life as its true exactly. subject. But Swifts exactly. were the perfect vehicle for that. Absolutely. Keeping on Swifts uh, for, for, for the moment, yes, though, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, um, they are, as we know, um, in danger. Perhaps you could outline that. Perhaps you could also outline why you think they're particularly in danger. And um, particularly in Britain and Ireland, it, it, it's so noticeable that the, 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 the figures, uh, the, the decline is particularly precipitous here. I don't get it that um, there's, there's been a particularly differential decline in any of the factors that might be appropriate. You mean the population in Ireland um, hasn't declined, did you mean that? Or, 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 or indeed the, the built habitat, why has the built habitat changed well, dramatically? Because that's what we focus on often. Yeah, Swifts have declined across Europe, they're now considered near threatened throughout the EU. So it isn't just Britain. Um, but it probably is just um, where intensive agriculture and also where the responses to uh, insulation have also been most dramatic. So my guess is that places like southern Mediterranean areas where insulation is not so concerning, they probably haven't been affected. But, it, but essentially, post-60s architecture, the narrative is, and we saw recently this campaign for swift bricks in in the House of Commons, and Caroline Lucas gave a fantastic impassioned speech on behalf of Swifts, um, and, and, and in fact quoted uh, One Midsummer's Day, but um, uh, she, they're focused on, on buildings, the built environment, and of course I think that's probably a, a truly important part of why Swifts have declined by 60% since, <laughs> since 1995. 60% since 1995. So we've lost more than half of our swifts. The, the thing that makes me pause about the issue of house architecture 
is partly the fact that so many swift boxes have gone up so quickly all over Britain. And of course the birds are quite slow to adapt. Uh, and just as the best illustration of that is that when I was doing the research on how swifts became so embedded in the civic and urban environment, I, I couldn't find any evidence that in the classical period swifts used houses. The famous images of swallows in um, <coughs> Santorini from date from the 5th, 5th millennium BC or the 3rd millennium BC. So swallows were using houses and buildings for thousands of years. But Aristotle um, doesn't refer to a, a, doesn't refer to, as far as I can see, to common swift as a bird that nests in the urban environment. Yeah. Pliny doesn't. And both of them talk about swifts nesting in cliffs. And the original nest sites of swifts was cliff faces and treetops, yeah. holes in trees. And there is a tiny population in Abernethy which still uses holes in trees, but many of the birds in the subarctic region are tree nesting birds. So, so swifts probably were slow to switch to buildings, and the earliest evidence is from about the 13th century, um, as far as I know. So they were quite slow, and I think their adaptation to nest boxes will also be quite slow, but, but, but certainly many people are having great success with calls, etc. But I am reluctant to say that it is just nest boxes. And I outlined for Caroline Lucas the figures on invertebrate dependent migrants that breed in Britain. And the pattern is just extraordinary. Um, Redback Shrike, 100% decline. Rhinec, completely insect dependent, 100% decline. Spotted Flycatcher, since 67, 92% decline. Uh, Windchap, 57% decline. Uh, Wood warbler, 78% decline. Swallow, 23% decline. Cuckoo, I think it's about 50% decline. House martin, 33% decline. The critical thing about some of those is that they're actually increasing in Scotland. Now, I know there are arable areas with intensive use of pesticides in Fife, but most of the populations are expanding beyond that up in the highlands. Willow warblers, if you go into the highland area, are astonishingly abundant. Willow warbler has declined by, I think it's something like 10%, but that is compensated by the increase of willow warblers in Scotland. Willow warblers in southern England, I mean, I used to live in an area where willow warblers sang, their decline was pretty precipitous. Even in Derbyshire, I think they're declining. I walked through the whole of the Wye Valley yesterday and there were no willow warblers singing. I walked that walk 50 years ago in 73 and I looked at my notes and I had willow warblers throughout the, the, de the dale and it's now all chip chaps and black caps and the difference is that those birds are making migrations from Spain and Portugal and North Africa and black bird, a black cap a little further. So I think there must be something about what Richard maybe calls the occult impact of pesticides. Yeah. And I cited for uh, an article I wrote recently, 10 grams, two teaspoonfuls of neonicotinoids deployed with greatest effect can kill 2.5 billion insects. 2.5 thousand million insects. And France is looking at cutting out pesticides. And it is totally untenable and unsustainable if you think that, you know, we are dependent upon insects for somewhere between 250 and 570 billion dollars worth of, of, of pollination by insects every year and, and every year we're dumping on them an average of 3.5 million tons of insecticide so I'm reluctant to say um, build a swift box and they shall come but mm -hmm. I, I will be the first to apologize if I'm wrong on that issue I don't think it's just about giving nature a home, much as I adore and love Caroline Lucas. I think it's much more systemic than that, and it's about appreciating that there are occult and unseen dimensions to ecological processes that are not, uh, uh, that are not embraced by simplistic uh, uh, notions of put up a blue tip box and blue tip populations will be 
will be healthy. So that would be that's a very long answer to your question, but but a very full one. And um, and and this is this is where we'll be we'll, we'll be going in, in a short while, as it, as it were. But um, let's get so let's get to what what what, what you describe the book as. You, you say it's. It's not um, not strictly a science book, uh, but um, but the hybrid form conventionally associated with the term nature writing. Yes. Well, I mean, two things. First of all, um, Mary, my partner, or Maria, as you may know her, um, doesn't like me to say it, but it's as close to a novel as I will ever probably get, because there was no day of looking at Swiss. You know, I invented this structure. I mean, there are, there are several reasons for that. I, I wanted a narrative arc by which I could talk about the interconnectedness of life. And so I needed some structure. The Swift was my symbol and my vehicle, my symbolic vehicle for narrating this yeah. connectedness. But then I cited it within a single garden over a single day. And you will find, if you look carefully, that you won't be able to locate where the garden is and you shouldn't be able to name the day that I use because those are part of its fictional status. And because I wanted to echo or shadow in some oblique way the book of Genesis where we had this, we all know the, the most, as it were, simplistic or overarching um, story of how life became um, set in a six-day uh, pattern and uh, I wanted to echo that but, but then go on to offer what is as much science as I have ever embraced. I mean I'm an English graduate so and I know um, Sally's son David is here in the audience so he's an evolutionary biologist and I have had corrections already to the first print of the book. So I am not a scientist, but I have incorporated as in a, a similable form as I could possibly achieve the science of how life has come about, if you like. So it contains more science than I've ever done, and more fiction. Were you a bit worried about the amount? I mean, I like the science, I welcome it, but I, were um, you worried that everyone would? Well, I've had, you know, conflicting responses, but generally pretty positive. People saying that they have to have, you know, a, a tablet or a phone nearby where they can look stuff up. And, um, and that was necessary because, you know, I thought, well... Well, it started between 2008 and about 2012. I wrote this article, and I put life had been on Earth a billion years, thinking that was a long time. <laughs> that was a long time, and somebody said, hasn't life been on Earth longer than that? And of course it has. It's been on Earth for 3.8 thousand million years. You are, all of you, an inheritor and have ancestors. I mean, that's the weird yeah. thing. We all have ancestors going back 3,800 million years, crossing species, of course. Hominids in the last 200,000 years, but before that are the forms of, you know, and all of us are an inheritor, not only of the genes that began, but an inheritor of the processes within ourselves. So your, your microbiome is absolutely now pivotal. I don't know if you know the world within us, I think it's called, or... Uh, great book by Ed Yong, buy my book first but by his second, um, where he talks about the absolute central importance of our bacterial life within us that makes life possible. So, so I began to unearth as best I could these relationships across great spans of time. I mean, the other thing that I find so difficult, you know, when we go outside after tonight and there will be Swiss still flying overhead and we think the world is sort of being made moment by moment, and yet we are also living on this incredibly ancient, yeah. re you know, re recreating itself planet. And, and I think it's important to, to kind of see those time spans, to understand both our smallness, but also the, the reverence with which yeah. we should treat it. Reverence is an interesting word. I mean, I, I, I sense in your book a desire to show that, well, J.K. Cheston talked about the, the submerged sunrise of wonder, and I sense a desire in, in your book to, to let that sun rise, but show that true wonder is, not, is, is actually in understanding those complexities across time and space yes. in nature. Yes, well, I think wonder is a central word in the, in the, 
in the compilation of the book, because I think of Wanda as just a kind of standing in awe of it, but also investigating and, and exploring it, but standing beneath it, you know, standing in, in humility towards it. And, and I suppose it is, you know, a wonderful book in the sense that it tries to recreate how extraordinary life is, but it's also wandering in, in, in pondering its, its, its connections, etc. And I think that perhaps comes to the way that, that we, we view na nature I in the United Kingdom. We think of ourselves, let's focus on the United Kingdom, though it's not applicable only there. Um, we think of ourselves as a nation of nature lovers, and yet, yet, yet we're a little bit frightened of science. Well, we're frightened of the science, and I, I personally don't think we are. We pride ourselves. We have this extraordinary tradition um, embedded in land ownership of sport, and then slowly from sport, mm -hmm to science and investigation and an extraordinary rich scientific tradition dating back all the way to early uh, pioneers like John Ray etc but I, I don't actually think that is true you know we live in the eighth most nature depleted yeah. land on on earth um, that's England specifically 28th I think it is overall um, or 17th I can't remember the exact Ruth might know the figure a friend of mine is on the front seat, so. Um, but I can't remember the exact, um, the exact number, but it's very low. And the other thing is um, Miles Richardson, who's a, a fantastic professor at Derby University, says that of all the developed nations in Europe and in the G7, we are the least nature connected. So we have these communities, these minority communities, um, which are substantial, and we live in an echo chamber surrounded by thousands of people who share our views. Yeah. But, but actually, um, I was looking through the trolling that Caroline was suffering as she gave one or two tweets about talking about squibs. And there was one guy who'd said, presumably a Londoner, I don't know, he said, who wants a swift? This horrendous, noisy bird screaming in my loft. I certainly don't want it. Now, I don't wish to um, uh, blacken him or even, you know, but to think that those attitudes coexist with the kind of passionate devotion which somebody like your Swift expert in a league feels. You, you know, you can't, you can't contemplate how little the rest of life means to so many people. In fact, I'm going to write a blog post called This Nasty Life. Because for many people, um, life is somehow very complicated and tainted. We have gardens in Buxton on the street where I live where they have obliterated. I have members of my own family that have done that. I, I can't believe it. You know, I'm shocked. Sorry. Well, no, 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 absolutely. I, 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 was, I was very... We have those two in, two, two in league. Um, that, that's, that's for sure. But Because I, I was very struck, for example, the other, the other day, I, I, I and a couple of other MCA people went on a Buxton Field Cup, of which you remember, Buxton Field Cup trip to... Um, Victory Quarry, fantastic day um, or evening, um, wonderful. Then Chance took us to the Fairfield Estate for a meal. Um, and we were two miles away um, from a group of people in love with nature, um, you know, with their nets out, their, you know, etc. Et then two miles, two miles, we're on the Fairfield Estate. There's nothing worse. There, it, there's, there's nothing bad about the people on the Fairfield Estate. Yeah, They're yeah, human beings not. like everyone else with everybody. <laughs> but it was like a different world. Yeah. So, well, I mean, you know, the truth is that poverty is a central part of this. I mean, I did a piece last year about the treescape of Buxton. You know, Buxton is a, is a deeply divided, almost schizophrenic community with, with very poor people with no trees on their streets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you go down the posh middle class Vera Britain side of Box, and there are trees everywhere, yeah, fantastic yeah. treescape. But you go to poor areas, and they can't have any trees. You know, we don't want to get them yeah. green and shaded and lovely. Yeah, and yeah. So, so poverty is a big part of that. And, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of it. No. But my, my deep belief is that um, environmental action is also about social justice. That's a completely separate book. But, but, but without social justice, without a pyramidal structure to society, 
I personally believe there can never be a proper environmental achievement. But, but the larger point to make is that humans live in a, have no other species in terms of evolution. Worms, you know, they just pull them up and eat them, and no species has cared. The difference for us is, is of course, our consciousness, our extraordinary gift for, for communication, language, etc. And we are both privileged in being the one most powerful organism that the earth has ever seen, um, but we also um, have enormous responsibilities, you know, and I, I think it's this exceptionalism, this idea that the rest of life exists only for us which of course is how a blackbird behaves. It's just that we're so out of kilter with the rest of our own community. And it isn't just people who, who, who are, as it were, deracinated from nature, as we're taught by poverty, etc. Perhaps the, 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 the problem lies slightly closer to home, and um, perhaps in, you know, in those people who regard themselves as, as it were, friends, friends of nature. I mean, I, I hesitate to ask a, a writer this question, but is it perhaps also slightly a literary and, and, and cultural issue um, ever since uh, the romantics of the late, 19th, or the late 18th century? Um, we look at landscape, yet we forget what lies within it and the, the complexity. Yes, I mean, I, I was just at a fantastic exhibition of um, uh, David Hockney's in the Saltair in... Um, in Bradford, just on the outskirts of Bradford at the weekend, you know, and they're fantastic. I mean, Hockney is a phenomenon, an extraordinary, and he's a snappy dresser too, even in his 90s. <laughs> but um, he'd done this extraordinary series of um, paintings with his, um, with his iPad. Uh, and, and what I thought was interesting, and I see it quite commonly in, and Celia maybe wanted to talk about this, I see it in landscape um, photographs that the thing that appeals to them most is not the entangled, uncompressible, undefinable complexity of real nature, but the kinds of landscapes which humans create because they yeah. have this they have this frame of of linear processes yeah. within it. And we find walls cut, uh, you know, look at Paul Nash's paintings of yeah. beech trees set within a, on a hilltop, and a bare, barren hilltop, devoid of anything but sheep and this beach, uh, hanging beaches or whatever. You know, art, Hockney's paintings, are of fallen landscapes, yeah. impoverished landscapes. People come to the Peak District and they see the, the complex, rectilinear patterns of the walls, and, and they see these green fields with cattle and sheep in them, and they think they're beautiful. And they are beautiful. I find them beautiful. I find open moorland landscapes beautiful, but truthfully, they're not complex. They're not diverse, and they and they're so fallen in terms of their potential. So I do think art has a has an extraordinary role to play, and we are seeing writers. I just recently, bizarrely, wrote a piece for Country Life on John Clare. Clare's one of the most interesting artists for me, still to his full significance to be discovered, because John Clare is dissented from his stories. He doesn't occupy the centre ground, you know, the, the, the story he tells, he is just part of the republic of things yeah. which he yeah. loves. And I think it's that, that decentering of ourselves yeah. from life, of seeing ourselves as part of, yeah. which is the only way we will overcome the crises of climate change, by seeing ourselves as party to a process, yeah. instead of just the apex thing at the top that says, I don't like Swifts, you know, they make a lot of noise and all. You know, and that's just, yeah. that's just one small example of how we need to decenter ourselves from our relationship. But it's a, the relentless solipsis, solipsism, really, of, of, of the human gaze at nature. Isn't yes, it? it is to some extent. I mean, we can't blame them all. As I say, Claire mm. is an extraordinary exception, and and I think that full significance of the way in which he's he's always there in his poems, but he hardly he hardly features. It's as it were the whole. Not and actually, one of the interesting things if you read his poem about the nightingale or skylock or whatever. The skylock itself is only part of the, the whole. He's actually narrating ecological narratives, what I call you know, the ecological imagination, a capacity to imagine relatedness and relationships.
Yeah, I must say I agree with you. If, if, if I was on a, on, on a lifeboat and a, a copy of John Clare and, and Wordsworth, I know which one would go over the, over the side <laughs> first, and that would be Wordsworth and make a very heavy plot too, it would. Um, that's for sure. Um, let's, let's talk, let's um, t turn to what we can actually do about the, 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 the problem um, you've identified. I mean, you, you, apart from many other things, are a historian uh, uh, of, as it were, the nature game. Um, Ever, ever since, ever since National Trust was founded, ever since the the great post-war um, burst of activity, we've been talking about essentially conservation, preservation. Yeah. We're now ever since the Lawton Report, really. We're now moving into a different, well, something different. Nature recovery. Is that just preservation boosted, or is it a, a different game altogether? Well, I think we started out with. Um, very limited resources and very little deep depth of, of, comp of comprehension of how ecosystems function. And so we are now at a point where, you know, most environmental organisations are talking about um, <coughs> landscape scale conservation and the need for there to be, you know, pathways across whole landscapes. There's no point isolating, you know, the most extreme I know is a hawthorn tree at, uh, just outside Norwich, which is the smallest nature reserve. It's just a single tree. Uh, and that, in a sense, is, is quite a good metaphor for the, for the archipelago of little patches that we yeah. saved. Of course, for, for totally understandable reasons, they didn't have the resources to buy big patches. But now we know that, systems, that, that nature functions as a single system. And um, another devastating book on roads by Paul Donald, which, is, which you should get. Paul's parents live on Lyme Road in Buxton. You should get him to come and speak. This book is an absolute landmark text on the impact of roads. So I think, I think we do get the message of connectedness. I think one of the other things that I would talk about is the... There was a very interesting Guardian piece the other day about directionists and, and destinationalists, on how it divided up into two camps those that think that the end journey is all important and those that think that the direction of travel is most important. Now, I tend to be a direction of travel. I tend to think, you know, if nuclear actually helps us along the way, it can be part of the solution and we shouldn't all be dogmatically preoccupied with our own sense <coughs> of what the destination should be. So I am a kind of inclusive person, but, but I think... Um, Freud came up with this extraordinary um, definition, which is so, so, so important to environmentalists, and something that, that I think has been important and overlooked is, Freud called it, and Christopher Hitchens is very good on it, the narcissism of small difference. And the narcissism of small difference, broadly, is the Palestinian, Palestinian army for liberation and the liberation army of Palestine <laughs> as mocked yes. in the life of Brian. <laughs> And environmentalists are very good at dividing up into these different destinations. Mm -hmm. And, and it, is, it is a very difficult issue. But truthfully, um, the narcissism of small difference defeats us at source. And, and, tr and the other side of that is, um, I, I recently, I think it was Monbiot who was talking about the actual total mass that you need to make a difference. It's about 3% or 4% of the population. It's actually quite small. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do, environmentalists, if measured by the environmental organizations, mm -hmm. do represent about 10%. And if we could find a blueprint for change, yeah. and, and if all of the organizations could embrace <coughs> the, the, the sense of impending crisis in a country, specifically England, the eighth most denatured, denatured in the world, then we would have a much powerful voice, and we saw it fantastically when Truss announced, you know, we're going to revert to a kind of economic model that was, that was rolled out in the early 1980s under Thatcher, and she was looking at a blueprint for that kind of economic development, which threw to the four corners, threw, threw to the wind issues of environmental responsibility, and they all stood up, yeah. all 78 organizations. So... As, as, you know, I don't really want to talk about the politics of it, if you don't mind. But but I think that the answers lie <coughs> in 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 trying to find unity across them and actually sit down, you know, work it out, you know, mm. so that it became a programmatic way of yeah. working. Who cares whether it's one organisation 
or another. Let them all stand up together. So, mm -hmm. and I, I know that that is a particular passion passion of yours and locally. Yes, you guys are fantastic. Well. Yeah. Um, but but so, let, let, let's go back to the tool, tools that, that we now, in theory, have on on nature recovery. Principally, the Environment Act 2021. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> well, I say yes because I know nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing of it on it in the yeah. book. I mean, one of the things no. that I wanted to do with the book was really to celebrate, um, to celebrate this process of connectedness and actually to explain it. So really, you know, I am working on another book, um, or another s several books, which which would. To embrace the the environment act, but I am a little bit shaky on it. So maybe you could. Don't worry. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not shaky on it. But it, knowledge doesn't make you happier. The knowledge of the environment act does not make you a happier person. So no, I think that, ignorance is bliss. Yes. Well, I think any attempt to relegate nature and the value that we attribute to nature to only you know if we subsume um, nature under some economic subclause, you know, that ecological re ecological services or, or um, natural capital. Natural capital and all these things rolled out by Dieter Helm, I mean are are a catastrophe for our for our whole relation for, for issues of wonder, you know, once you put a price on, well how do you value midges? You know, let's take midges as an example or, or mosquitoes or any of the biting insects of the northern <coughs> holarctic region, an enormous belt of northern, and they are hell, no one loves mosquitoes. <laughs> but you know, many migrant birds, thousands and millions of migrant birds, move to those northern hemispheric regions to feed on the yeah. superabundance of invertebrates. I mean, you know, you'd end up saying that actually the economic value of destroying all biting insects because you would unleash tourism, would far outweigh. So I think any kind of econometric um, sovereignty in our recognition of our relationship of life is deeply problematic. So does biodiversity net gain get you going in the morning? Well, I, I mean, I was asked to be involved in talking about it. You know, one of the problems is that ecosystem, you know, knowing how nature works, understanding the slowness of natural processes, as if that could be commodified and converted into the kind of models that, that, that economists and, and business people use, you know, building markets and those yeah. kind of things. You know, ecosystem, Oliver Rackham famously said that a thousand one hundred year old, ten, ten thousand one hundred year old oaks are no more valuable than one five hundred year old. There's a 500-year-old oak in Hereford, which is the only site in Britain where an insect occurs. You know, I mean, that, that just cannot be filtered yeah. through an econometric measure. And I think that is deeply problematic. And the problem is getting people to the table to say those things is so difficult. So difficult. You know, we're so held out of yeah. the political process. Do you want me to do a reading on swifts? <laughs> <laughs> do do, uh, do, do I, I just well I, I, I just thought I, well I, I told you I was going to do a reading, and Mark and I agreed, but we've moved so far away from the content of the book, which I'm totally, <laughs> totally cool about. So I thought I would just read something just to calm me down. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is about I mean this is just an extraordinary component of swifts. They migrate. Um, from Beijing to um, to southern Africa across 34 countries. The, no, the countries that, that, are, that they crossed, they were, had these geolocators put on their backs. And the list of countries is itself a kind of poem. And these, gra these little things weigh about a gram. But it allowed us to map the journeys that Swifts made. But these, I thought, are quite interesting. I'm only going to read them as a preliminary to my reading. But these are the countries that those 11 Swiss crossed over. China, Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Iraq, Syria, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, 
Jordan, Yemen, Egypt, Libya, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Southern Sudan, Central African Republic, Chad, Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, Angola, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, South Africa, and Namibia. And I thought, you know, that is quite an interesting way of seeing why Swifts are such extraordinarily powerful symbols of, of the unity of the planet. But I, I thought we aren't really allowed to see it ourselves. We somehow can't dig it out and, and, and appreciate it when we encounter one. But this is an occasion where I thought I did that. So I'm just going to read this and then we'll go back to ecosystem services. And... <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. no, no, no. no. <coughs> I've glimpsed, some, glimpsed something of this process within myself once. It was not a common swift party to the continent-shrinking odyssey above, but merely a pair of birds over a part of the Peak District. I was with my partner Maria and a friend, John Beatty, and we'd walked all day to and from the gritstone monoliths, known as the Barrow Stones, perhaps the most remarkably beautiful such rocks in an area rich in these natural monuments. Assailed by frost and sculpted by thousands of years of westerly wind, these 300 million year old stones have lithe and sinuous limb-like bodies and strangely Picassian heads. To reach them you have to follow the line of the River Derwent in a northwest of it, oh, to the foot of a slope on which the Barrow Stones stand, that make the last short 30 minute ascent to the round hump from which they've gazed since the last ice age. At this point one has a 360 degree view over a landscape that is the second highest of anywhere in England, south of that spot. The place called Bleaklow is at the heart of a peat bog in the middle of the country, yet it felt as if there were no more lonely and isolated place in all Britain. It's a land of muted tones chased with shadows, brown, olive, grey, green-grey, silver-grey, brown-purple, bleeding one into the other, and all is rounded and folded so that the soft contours seem to partake of the same gentle chromatic variation and enclosed in its gradual, graduated sameness which continues in every direction for perhaps 20 kilometers we could see not a single human on any horizon nor any building nor even the most basic <coughs> insignia of our species and all about us was totally silent. As I pondered this solitude, I saw two swifts passing as silhouettes, riding bluffs of the westerly airstream that were blasted up from the line of the land, yet the birds were easy and evenly paced and flew in long, careless loops. I watched them meander steadily until they were lost to view. It made me realize that this place, which bound and diminished not only ourselves, but a sense of our kind, was no more to those pilgrims than five minutes, a variant riverine flow of muted tone in spring's immense hemispheric delta of colour, and then they were gone. Mm -hmm. Their gaze is very different than ours. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. And we'll, we'll go on to, in, 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 to questions um, uh, in, a, in a second. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll end um, by asking you, um, giving your powerful message on, on, on the damage we are doing to the environment. Um, are you still, are you an optimist, a pessimist? Um, well, I only have one sentence in the book on, um, on what we've done to the planet. But the sentence took me three days to write, and it, it runs for two and a half pages. <laughs> so I, the, the passage I wrote, I read you, was a stealing from Cormac McCarthy and and J. A. Baker, in a sense, that view <clears throat> of the landscape as a kind of delta. But um, uh, this particular stealing was 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 from was from um, Proust. So it's two and a half pages, and I try and compress into that the full impact of. Of, of, our, of our impacts upon nature. Um, but I am an optimist in this sense. You know, one of the things that was extraordinary about studying 
um, the long, deep time of life and our relationship with... I mean, the, the whole of life is, is founded on, on, on a platform, a great synthesizing body of monocellular life, which evolved first 3.8 billion years ago. About 2.5 billion years ago, it de had developed already the oxygen that is at the heart of all uh, vertebrate and, and, and what's called eukaryotic life. And everything about the chemistry of life is determined by monocellular organisms. Every second breath you take in this room is thought to be from oxygen developed by phytoplanktonic organisms in the sea. Though we privilege trees, and we are all in love with trees, and one of our political parties actually has a tree as its central symbol, and they now outcompete one another to plant trees. Um, trees are only part of the extraordinary process of, of photosynthesis and, and you know we should love our inner bacteria as much as we love our inner tree but what I realised was that life is so invulnerable to our processes yeah. to what we'll do to it of course we could obliterate giraffes and elephants and the way we're going you know, all these extraordinary charismatic animals which we've all grown up with, well, I grew up with as toys and things. I mean, that could possibly come to pass, you know. But life itself will go on, and the one species that is most at risk from our own success is our own yes. species. So, so really, you know, I am, you know, all I can tell you is that life is invulnerable to us. The processes are so strong. I mean, you know, I was looking at um, the limestone walls above Ashford yesterday. I mean, all those limestone walls are quarried out of life. I mean, those were organisms that lived 300 million years ago and 350 million years ago. And then on top of those are the lichens that can survive any amount of nuclear radiation. There was a lichen community or lichens that were held in a, in a herbarium and somebody happened to dribble some water on them and they were a hundred years old and those lichens came back to life. So, you know, life's processes are completely invulnerable to us and we need to get with it, you know, we need to share it and we need to value it, that's the thing. To save ourselves, I mean, this is truthfully what it's about. To save ourselves, you know. So, so that's as hopeful as I get. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't had another drink, you know. So I, I may get more cheerful or worse as time goes on. <laughs> I think we should all, all, all follow Antonio Gramsci, who in fact actually was Roman Roman, but he Roland, but um, but Gramsci made a famous pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I think that 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 should should always be yeah. the. Um, the motto for anyone involved in the environment. Yes, I think so. I mean, you know, you there are some. I mean, all of you, all of you are doing extraordinary stuff. You know, you aren't you aren't assailed by you aren't overwhelmed with the su success of what you're doing, but you keep on going, and that's the extraordinary thing. You know, people. You know, there's a fantastic quote from from Václav Havel, which Seamus Heaney uh, adapted. You know, he said. Uh, um, oh, look it up. But it's a fantastic quote, you know, that hope, uh, that hope is, is, is not about that things will turn out well, but that there's important work to do. Yeah. And that's, I think, what hope mm -hmm. is. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, well, Mark, thank you very much for, for, for that. Um, we do have um, time for questions. If any... If from farmers. Do people realise that when they put the flea stuff on their dogs and the dog goes swimming, mm. it kills the, the plankton and everything else in the river? Yes, that's a very, very interesting point. The lady said, we all talk about pesticides on our food, but do we realise that these neonics, which are now widely used as dog treatments to deal with internal parasites and fleas, are equally problematic? Well, I... I mean, I have a, a series of ponds near me which have very large populations of frogs and toads. And I am constantly talking about the issue of these pesticides and trying to get people to, 
to not let their animals go into these ponds. In fact, my next Guardian piece is about the thousands of little toadlets and frogs which were making their exodus from the pond just the other day. But, but yes, it's a very important point, you know. And this is the book is about the ecological, what I call the ecological imagination. It is about us understanding that not only are we we're bound into a life that everything we do has consequences. This is not to, to uh, vilify in any way um, dogs or ownership of dogs, but, um, but, but to be aware that these are, the, these are choices we're making and each of them... I mean, I fly, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to be lecturing anybody on, on issues, and, and I have eaten meat until recently, but... I am on a journey myself, and it's about understanding the consequences of absolutely everything that we do, including, you know, letting our dogs swim in the rivers. Also, you said that poor people, their environment is not as good as rich people's. Poor people, poor people can still grow trees and flowers. Just because they're poor don't mean they can't have No, a no, of course, I wouldn't suggest that. And, of course, one of the hearts of... Uh, the post-war building project, if you ever have seen a council house built in the 1940s by the Attlee government, I mean, those all had big gardens because they expected them to grow food in them. And, you know, now I look at the new bills, um, particularly around Buxton, but, I mean, it can be anywhere. There are no gardens. No. There is no living space. They are abiotic zones around the houses. Uh, and that worries me deeply, and that is part of this withdrawal from a relationship with complexity. Although I have to say that I'm very angry with the slugs in my garden. If they <laughs> could get rid of them eating my bloody corn jet. <laughs> I would. Get some hedgehogs. I'd love to have a hedgehog. Have you got any spare? Yeah. Actually, we, we've, got we've got one. We've got a hedgehog in our garden. Have you? Yeah. 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 We well, I need one that specialises in big black slugs. <laughs> so, so, so I'll take the privilege of asking a question. If you see a hedgehog in the, gar in the garden, uh, I know you're not a hedgehog specialist, but if you see a hedgehog in the garden uh, during in midday, that's not good, is it? No, there was one scene in the... Pavilion Garden. I saw it in Pavilion Garden, but we've also saw yeah, one in our garden. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's quite a big lot of reporting of this. I tell you what, I saw the other day a mole. I couldn't believe it come mm. up to the surface. I'm sure these yeah, these so aberrations are not out of good health. Is what I'd say. But that's yeah. that's all I know about that. Any other questions or, or comments? I mean, you know, yeah. the other thing is points. Well, <coughs> is <coughs> the biggest problem with the planet us? Yes. Because <laughs> the planet will go off. The planet life will go will off. Carry on. Life will carry it's on. It's just us at the problem. Sadly, we might not be here yeah. to see it. And that's the thing that I think is tragic because, you know, we tell the stories. We have this extraordinary creative capacity. Um, but life will go on. That's the key thing. And um, no other species uh, offers this level of jeopardy to the rest of life on our planet. And we make a lot of stupid decisions, but there are. But the other thing about the ecological imagine is, imagination is that every action you take, every single action we take, can make a difference. And that's the other key, part, the, the key bit of hope that a man who is seven eighths empty, you know, that's nearly full for me. Um, but um, but you know, another hope is that every action we take, it makes a difference. And. As I say, I know all of you are doing incredible stuff. Well, yeah. I had a question sent, um, sent in to me. Um, that's posh, isn't it? <laughs> uh, someone Facebook me said they couldn't come. Um, he, he, he lives, um, actually, he lives on Hairgate, um, one of those, well, that part of it, post war estate, um, and watches the Swifts avidly. Um, but he's, he's particularly fascinated by reports of flying ant columns near the, near the south coast. Um, he, he said, are they linked with their, the timing of their migration to Africa? I think you touch on that in a well, way. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in ants and spent a lot of time, bizarrely, yeah. researching ants for the book because a very big part of swift diet globally is, is, is social insects. Um, and, um, and, and wherever there are reports of what swifts have been eating, often it's, it's flying ants. Um, but I'm interested in ants because social insects are the dominant organism 
other than ourselves on the planet. Um, the total cumulative weight of ants is thought to be not far off the total weight of humanity. And of course, social ants, once you start to look, are absolutely everywhere. So I write a lot about insects because, because <coughs> swifts are nothing but insects. I mean, that's all swifts are. I mean, essentially, they are insects processed by their own respiratory processes. Uh, and therefore, you know, to view them through the lens of what I call the ecological imagination is to understand that to build a box for them is one thing, but if they're dependent upon insects, mm -hmm. yeah. then look to your insect to know the health of your swifts is, is my rule of thumb argument, but I don't have any data to back that up. I mean, this is a very interesting image. Um, swifts in congregation over a Norfolk farm. Um, very often now, these uh, rape fields are full of flea beetle because um, farming, and intensive farming especially, um, creates its own pest problem. If you, if you have just a single crop over vast areas, then a single organism will come to prey on those areas. And, and flea beetle is a really, really big issue for growers of rape, but also they're finding that increasingly all swifts are eating is these flea beetles. When I say flea beetle, there are about 50 species. But, but you know, this is what I think I was looking at here over this crop. And it's stank to high heaven because it slightly rots. And in fact, Jake Fines grows it specifically to feed his swifts. <laughs> yes, it was yeah. up near Holcomb. What's extraordinary is how they find these places. Um, and I just spent a day or an afternoon photographing them at this site. So, um, what was your question, Mark? Oh, about... Uh, uh, flying ants. Oh, flying yeah, ants. Wow. Well, yeah. High abundance of insects. I mean, this is what I find extraordinary about insect abundance. I describe in... Um, in Lake Malawi, they get such abundance of these coronamid midges that people drown in them. Wow. People drown in them. They're out in, on the lake, and the hatch out happens, and it affects your... Mm. They're so dense. Mm. Um, obviously, that's heaven for swifts. Well, I suppose it isn't. They must stay at the periphery of that hatch out. But that is insect abundance of extraordinary density. But, I mean, slightly less macabre idea is that Insect flight is, I and mean, flying insects are, are absolutely central to the ecology of swifts, and so swifts do eat. Do eat. The myth of the flying ant day. Hey, up, lads. Yeah. You know, it's the 18th of August. <laughs> We're all going to, you know. I mean, that is a bizarre myth. And yeah. I find it um, uh, quaint and. Um, it's quite a harmless myth. Though. It's a so quite a harmless myth. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Although, just. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, 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 go, go Well, on, I was going to say, Eamon Andrews was advising, advising people in the Daily Mail how to get rid of ants from your garden. Oh, yeah. Eamon Andrews, yeah. Blank him when he speaks to you on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not friends with him, but I'm on Facebook. But I yeah. think there was a question over there. Yeah, uh, question, it's not evolutionary, don't worry. Today yeah. uh, you see intensive farming, and I thought it would be nice to ask you your opinion, and maybe everyone in the room of this idea that is very debated at the moment in the ecologist conservation about the granularity of our conservation. Do we sacrifice areas like Norfolk and just use those intensively for farming and say, okay, that's that, but luckily yeah. we can keep leek and the peak is beautiful because we can rewild that. How, how do you think about that? <coughs> Yes, well, I'd be interested to hear other views of other people um, on that. But my own feeling was, when I first heard it floated by Andy Clements of the BTO about 15 years ago, I, I, you know, I thought it was terrible. But having read um, George Monbiot's Regenesis and the issue of agricultural sprawl and the minute contribution made by, forgive me if you're a sheep farmer, but um, the minute <laughs> contribution made by sheep farms to our overall diet is so minuscule yeah, yeah. in proportion to the vast acreage that we yeah. devote to it, and also the costs in terms of methane and in terms of carbon loss sequestered or lost yeah. from the landscapes that these things graze, and the fact that the total value of the sheep is less than the tourism in Derbyshire and yet we devote 4 million hectares to it, it starts to become 
necessary to talk about how do we compensate for the less than 2% that sheep contribute to the British diet, less than 2%, yet we are using 4 million hectares in area equivalent to Wales, Derbyshire, Yorkshire and Lancashire, oh. with nothing. I mean, don't imagine Lancashire with Halifax and the Saltair. Don't imagine anybody living there. That's a sheep field, just a sheep field. Then that starts to become a necessary part of our thinking. And I think, you know, yes, I, 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 I completely swung by regenesis and, and what Monbiot calls agricultural sprawl. And... Um, you know, in the end, if you read his book and you understand it, he's edging towards the idea that really intensive agriculture is the only way out of the problems we face. We can't feed ourselves now with, agric with, with organic agriculture, even though, you know, I'm buying my organic cucumbers and trying to grow courgettes in my garden. Um, so it's a very good question, David. It's a very important point. And, and that's what I think the environmental movement should do, is act as a single organism, yeah, exactly. is debate these issues in a mm -hmm. chamber yeah. where they all gather and talk to one another mm -hmm. and come up with a strategy, for, you know. Yeah. Um, I did a book, Our Place, and he, he, Nicholson, Max Nicholson, who I met once in 95, Max tried to set up the Council of Nature in the 60s. That's how visionary that guy was. Mm -hmm. A council of nature, had it been functioning for the last 60 years, would have changed the landscape because they would have spoken as a single institution. So I think it's both an interesting point, an important point, and it needs unitary understanding of the issues and promulgation of a single project <coughs> about those kinds of questions. But yes, I would love to see some sheep pasture turn to, turn to nature. Forgive me, those of you who are sheep farmers. I don't think there are many in this, oh, okay. in this, this room. Um, yeah, yeah, question. Um, back. One, que oh, one question, maybe I'll answer, I don't know. What does a farmer who has got a number of acres up in this part of the world do if he doesn't raise sheep to make an income? Yeah. Well, that's an important point, and um, he. Yeah, I'm not here to answer that question, but he's got. To, or she, they have to change. They've been feather bedded and, and privileged with subsidies of hundreds of millions per annum so that most of these sheep farms are completely dependent on subsidies to survive. And many of them, I can't remember the figures, but it is an extraordinarily important part of their income. And they are under pressure now with us taking away the basic payment so that that underpinning of an uneconomic project is coming to an end. So what the future is for those people, I don't know, but it is an important question. But again, it can be worked out. You know, I, I'm here to talk about SWIFTS and the wholeness of life and many other issues. I don't have off pat the answer to the social and cultural issue of sheep farmers being dependent upon an old and, arch and as it seems, increasingly archaic system of production which is exported to France, yields nothing to the British diet, and is bad for the environment, has been privileged for, for 80 years, and really has no future, given that by 2040, about 50% of people will be vegetarian. So, you know, I'm not there to, to, to find the solution, but I, I offer the, the challenges which, which are there for them, and... Um, and, and for us to, divert, to decide, I suppose, is what I'd say. Yeah, Bear, bearing in mind, though, that their only source of income is their land. Yes. And then if you say, well, you know, what are you going to do? Not have sheep. Oh, okay. So then you pay from the dole, don't you? <laughs> they, <laughs> no, they could do many things with their land. Yeah. You, you know, there are now um, payments being made for all kinds of alternatives. Mm -hmm. You can, of course, still produce sheep of high quality on land, but at much lower levels, a much smaller flock, and, and that become a component of the kinds of things that, that you do. Um, but uh, but I, I don't really want to answer that question, because it's, 
Wait till I've done my next book and then I'll have some answers. But in, and, and in the last month they, they did increase the, the, the payments um, for, for farmers above the, principally sheep farmers above the, above the moorland line. But that even that will just keep them on life support effectively. It's not, pro, it's not really giving them a future. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not asking for the end yeah. of all sheep farming. I'm asking for some of them to see that it's necessary to change. That's what I'd say. Because yeah. I, I saw you interviewing George at Buxton last year, where he was, yeah, and um, the, I read Read Genesis, and I mean, there's so many I, really good practices. One of them is agroforestry, mm -hmm. where you grow um, lines of trees, fruit and nut trees, for example. You could perfectly well grow them in Derbyshire. In you know our life, you know, yes. our our land here, Reaps and then you grow crops land. like lentils, yeah. pulses, which are full of protein, linseed. You know they've got loads of very good um, nutrition in them. Yes. In between the trees, and then the trees protect those crops from mm -hmm. the wind. Mm -hmm. And it, you know it, the high land up here is windy. But if you have trees. You know, they've been doing it at Wakelands for four, over 40 years. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it can be done, yes. but we've got to have Im imagination, mm -hmm. think outside the box and get away from these subsidies, yeah. which have done the most colossal damage. Yes, yes. Did you all hear what this lady said? Did you all pick up everything she said? But, uh, yes, it's an important it's point. It's all very well, but what about the poor sheep? If nobody eats sheep... No. They're all going to die, aren't they? They're going to kill them all. Die, yeah. Well, they, they are all. They, forgive me. I'm <laughs> 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 it's like fox hunting. What happened to the foxhounds? I don't believe in fox hunting. No. But the foxhounds had to be put to sleep because they were no longer yeah. useful. Yeah. Every life is important, no matter if yeah. it's a sheep yeah. or a slug. Yes. Yeah. 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 I don't think any slug. Able. Yeah, as Mark says, they, I don't think anyone's um, anyone here is advocating closing down sheep, the, sh the sheep industry no. overnight, or, or indeed all of it, or, or indeed killing sheep before they would ordinarily be killed anyway. anyway yes, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but um, Lindsay, you have yeah, sorry, yes, Lindsay. something on a lighter note. I haven't finished reading the book, but um, I did pick up a very interesting culinary tip. I have never tried. Not for Crunchy. lamb, I hope. <laughs> Slugs. <laughs> I have never tried crunchy peanut butter on oat cakes. Ah uh, yes, well, that's a very important point. We won't get into the debate, knowing that Mark is near me, championing Staffordshire oat cakes. Well, I, I am in Staffordshire, so I need to be careful. But a big part of the book was writing the three meals, which are imaginary, of course, like the rest of the day. But but the food parts were important because they showed ways in which this connectedness with the rest of life is absolutely fundamental. And um, uh, I describe oatcakes as a champion of, of oatcakes from both Derbyshire and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, no, all oatcakes, I love them all. And the interesting thing is they're both about the same age, but my publishers and my editor were desperate to get, and they cut all my poetry about Derbyshire oatcakes um, and got it out of the book. There is a little bit about oatcakes, but I had an, had an oatcake this morning with peanut butter. If you've never tried, if you've never tried, I mean actually, bizarrely, I had exactly the breakfast that I described. I got my own black currants out of the garden. If you've never tried oatcake with peanut butter and black currant compote, come to ours tomorrow. <laughs> it's, Oh my god, and if you can risk it, some creme fraiche. But, uh, it's a great breakfast. I'm sure I know what we're going to be having. I just want to say butter and marmite. Hello. Butter and marmite. Butter and marmite. <laughs> you can do anything with right. OK. It is the most versatile food on the planet, and um, if one avoids the the nuclear conflict of whether it's Derbyshire or Staffordshire, <laughs> then you're fine. Right. Actually, Mark, there's some in Cheshire as well. Oh! oh. 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 Well, I must try oh. some Cheshire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a question, yeah. Yeah. A question at the back. Uh, your, um, or the journey that you quoted, which the Swifts took from Beijing to, to Namibia. 
Namibia. Did I miss a country out? That <laughs> illustrates the, that this isn't just a UK or EU problem, but it's going to require a, a sort of willingness on an international scale that I can hardly foresee. Yes. Well, I mean, there was an interesting example of international collaboration or conversation about the seabed. And, and you know, increasingly, um, to tackle issues such as migratory births, there will have to be international agreement across all these countries. I mean, it has to be said that, very, that the point you make is, is very important, that these are very difficult. Um, but, but understanding how life functions is, is necessary for us to act, to live alongside it. And, and you know, the argument of the book is that we have a moral responsibility. No, I mean, I, what I find extraordinary is this. Until the last 50, 60 years, Nobody has ever said that life and being alive and sharing life with other life forms is an end of civilization in itself, that the highest ideal of being civilized is to be alive and to share this livingness that we have uniquely, as far as we know, in the universe. And I mean, the life they're looking for in outer space is bacterial, of course, the foundation of all life. It seems to me weird that we have life from which we look outwards to the cello, Beethoven, Mozart, to palaces, to kings, to hierarchies, to politics, to war, to all these other things. <coughs> and yet being alive is not itself celebrated in a, in a curious way, centrally and with concern for the unity of all life. I find that <coughs> strange, you know, that somehow we've discounted the most incredible event that will ever happen to all of us, is to be alive, you know, so... Okay. <laughs> On that point, Mark will almost end. Right, this is... So you're not supposed to see this, it's not a great secret, but this is, these are the targets for Staffordshire Morelands. Um, Climate action. And no, uh, th those are being debated, a meeting I'm supposed to be at the start of this evening, but anyway, um, next door in Morelands House. But, um, no, the plan for nature, which we're a supporting authority, not a responsible authority. Um, am amongst them um, are, t uh, are two reintroduce or boost, which obviously is a total, you either reintroduce or boost, not both. So let's say reintroduce populations of two wild species in the Staffordshire Moorlands that have been identified. So two new species in the Staffordshire Moorlands, that's going to be one of the targets, which I'm a bit, I'm a bit about. But anyway, let's assume two new species in the Staffordshire Moorlands as part of the, um, as the part program. of the plan for nature. Your suggestions, and I'll ask for some from here. Two new species. Well, um, two new species. I say new, okay. reintroduce. Well, um, I quite like those wallabies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. I was the person that exterminated them. No, I'm joking again. Uh, I've seen that one in your, fa in your fantastic museum. Yeah. It's a rather beautiful beast. Um, crikey, it's a tricky one. Well, there are so many things that, you know, we could have saved and we've lost. I think bacteria? That's, well, I don't know any bacteria, no, no. I found a snail yesterday that was new for Derbyshire, which is quite nice. Um, nearly new, but I'm not going to promote um, the introduction of a snail, especially with these slugs. It's difficult for me to say, really, yeah. but I mean, there are so many species which I cherish from my childhood, which were here, and, yeah. and have gone, things like wood warbler, uh, wind chat, I mean, I haven't seen wind chat this year in Britain, um, and those were fantastic. I mean, obviously, uh, we have a very impoverished... Uh, Oh Christ, you really put me on the spot. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys, Arm? Um, well, I suppose, I mean, I've, first I've heard of that, 
I've worked with councillors. The first I've heard of that. But oh, don't tell them I told you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's perhaps the way to interpret that or take, uh, make that an opportunity. And I mean, there's no point in just bringing in a box full of, uh, of species and putting it here. They've got to have a, the right environment that's going to exactly. support Exactly, yeah. So if you were to select a species, I mean, it's been done by the wildlife charities for decades. Yes. You select a species that needs a habitat that then brings in lots of other things as well. So yeah. you might so have to select beaver. a part. I don't know yeah. what that species is. But beaver, just, it's, beaver. But, uh, it's got to be something that supports that. Yes, and I think, brings in other stuff. I think Arne's getting at the central point, which is a central message of this book. You know, ecosystems work as unitary, complex, interacting. The greater the fold of life that is within it, the more interesting that ecosystem. So I am against all this targeted, introduced species. But as, as architects of complex environments... The one that we're all besotted with at the moment is the beaver, and I would love to see beavers introduced um, with some provisos. But um, uh, yes, I think it's. I think Arm makes an important point that really is let's make the place suitable for life, for complex life. Um, and it's interesting to see parts of Europe. This is um, one area we went to to partly to chase D. H. Lawrence and Lady Chapel is lover, but this area of forest, this is a village, that's a, that was a place called Triora. Its population in the 1960s, or in the early part of the 20th century, was 3,000, now it's down to 295. There is a massive process of depopulation across large parts of southern Europe. And it's interesting to see what ecosystems are springing up. Very broken and fragmented tree-covered landscapes, totally impoverished bird life, both in Greece and in Italy, you can drive for hundreds of kilometers and see landscapes falling down to wilderness. So I would like to see systems of life coming back with some perhaps engineering from human beings. So I'm not really worried anymore about one creature or another, but, but beavers, I think, are, are key to that. Uh, what about uh, black grouse? Oh, God, don't get me on to black grouse. <laughs> <laughs> I used to come to Swallow Mouse to see those black grouse for about 20 years. I love and adore black grouse. But I don't want to see black grouse back without black grouse habitat. Yeah. And, and that's the, I suppose that's the key thing. I mean, the loss of those black grouse. Oh, but are they not on that edge? No, no. There are, there are one, one or two seen in Derbyshire now and again. Um, it's a very difficult, it's another, have you got Ruth to come and speak to you guys? This is Ruth Tinge here, she's a brilliant environmentalist, and Ruth is the sort of person you should ask those questions of. Sorry, Ruth. <laughs> I'll speak to you later, Ruth. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> She would be brilliant on those kinds of questions. I won't put you on the spot, Ruth. Well, right, one last point, and then we have to finish. Can we just go back a little bit? You're yeah. talking about um, the food for um, Swiss, etc. Et food for Swiss, yeah. We live up on Goldsich Moss, the end of Goldsich Moss. We always, have a, we always had a problem with midges. For the last few years, there have been very few. Very few, yes. It's an... And that's bizarre. Yes. Because they, they were a real pain. Yeah. You know, early in the morning and later in the night. Why have they gone? Well, you need Liz with you. Because, <laughs> yeah. When the midges come, they feed on her and you're left to watch the... That's actually true. <laughs> the night job. We should, we should but, but seriously, I would say, I mean, one of the interesting things to me is I spent quite a bit of time on the moorland and the desiccation of these peat landscapes mm -hmm. is quite extraordinary. And it's a common characteristic of springs in this area that we are seeing very dry moorland yeah. environments. And I think this year obviously has been exceptional because we have we've certainly had a lot of midges when we've been out. But um, I think it's definitely you know they're talking about a bumper year in Scotland this year. So I think it's when midges. midges. Yeah. You know that's it that you know when you try and find a value for midges. Um, <laughs> They're probably fed upon by by large numbers of, of birds. That the reason I'm asking that's here, that's yes. here now. Yeah. You know, that's not somewhere else. No, no, yeah. no. But I, but but I, I think it's an interesting point. Um, have 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 experienced big midges. 
uh, big Mitch hatch outs, but um, you're right, there are fluctuations. Yes. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's climate related, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Dan, thank you very much. That from, well, from swifts, through blackbirds, through beavers, through midges, to sheep farming, sheep farming <laughs> to oat cakes. Oat cakes. <laughs> Cheshire oat cakes. Can you have them with butter, with peanut butter? I don't even know. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd, I'd like to. Um, I've had, uh, there's a sign at the back. Donations, well, this was free, but donations welcome is, I think, Lindsay's message. But I'd. Um, the only, the only thing I'd, I'd ask you to do now, um, and that is free, totally free, is to um, give our thanks to Mark for what a fascinating <laughs> It's a great privilege to be here, if you just mind me to have a few, last, the last word. Um, it's, I always say to any event, if I can have somebody to act as an interlocutor, because the truth is, the interlocutor, in this case Mark, does a far harder job than I do. So I was going to say, any applause you give, <laughs> give for his fantastic work, for Lindsay for organising it.